Casual Magic has been brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can get cool stuff. Use the code CASUAL to get 5% off of your sale. And by Architect, a deck hosting website that doesn't really sell anything, but they like me and I like them, so kindly use them. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Casual Magic, the show where we talk about the fun side of Magic the Gathering. My name is Stephen Button. Casual Magic is brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., Coalesce Apparel, and Architect. Today, I have one of the Star City stalwarts from the up until very recently, and one of the members of the, God, I don't know, I watch that show all the time, but I can't remember the name, with Jeremy Knoll. Um, what the hell did you guys call it? Commander versus Commander versus. I was like, it's not Commander Clash. It's not Commander. No. It's Commander. Although something. I was recently on Commander Clash. Yeah, I mean, I Justin Parnell. I should actually say your name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Justin, I've been actually listening to you and watching you play Commander for years and years and years now. Yeah. So it's lovely to finally have you on the show. I'm so ecstatic to be here, Shovel. It's <laughs> it is a wonderful time to be able to talk about like the positive side of magic and the things we love about magic with the person who is one of the most positive, <laughs> overwhelmingly positive people in the community. So I'm just super excited to just talk about all the stuff we love. Yeah. So now that we're, let's get into magic 30. <laughs> oh yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, look, I, well, nothing is, nothing is off limits. I, I don't feel as salty about that product as other people, but I'm, I feel like enough has been said. Yeah. I don't, I, don't, I just don't, Honestly, I just don't care. Like it was like that's, that's it's a I thing feel. that happened, and there's so many magic things coming out that I would rather d deal with. It's like eh. I look so, at it the way yeah. I look at like theme packs. Like you go to Target <laughs> oh, and you God. see one of those like you know oh, theme packs. white from Dominar United or whatever, and it's like, well, that's great for whoever needs that. It's yeah. not going to be me. Have fun. Yeah. I definitely subscribe to the theory that, especially at this point in Magic, I mean. I've, I've been playing magic for we're closing in on 25 years. Nice. And youngster. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you got me by a few. Uh, and I, you know, like even though my job now and, ha and really has been for the last decade has been thinking about magic, talking about magic, you know, working with magic. I really just want to be able to pay attention to the products that I want to and just ignore the rest. And yes. since I've like kind of, been able to focus on that all this other stuff you know people people beef on twitter about stuff that's coming out just like look if you don't like it just ignore it you don't yeah, have to I'm, interact with it you don't have to buy it just just let it just i mean let it pass you on by next week they're gonna preview something else new what's the difference right or or like last week where it's just like oh here's all of the dominaria remix or whatever <laughs> exactly. remastered just like in a day <laughs> good luck go i was you just know, like you know what I don't want to interact with any of this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to take this, take this week off of this new product. And next week they're going to preview, uh, like pro Phyrex probably the day that this podcast comes out, that we're going to preview brothers war. And then we're going to be all, or, or wait, what's Phyrex the next set? Phyrexia? Phyrexia all will be one or all through the race. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, we're in a world where there's so much magic product that it's just like, there was a time when folks like you and me would have had to have known every set and yeah. like, Every two, three months, we would have been like completely fully engaged. We would have known every set, every card, every legend in there. And then they just started flooding. And it's like, okay, well, like we had a weird transitory period where the community feels like we need to catch up on everything. We need to be sure. It's like, yes. oh no, I'm still trying to figure out the 50 planeswalkers that came out in War of the Spark. What am I going to do now with the 800 legends that are in Commander Legends 2 or whatever? And now I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to find like the two legends that speak to me in a year. And that's going to be it. And the rest of the cards that come out in like 10 years, I'm going to hit Scryfall and hit random and something's going to come up and I'm going to be like, I've never I've seen never this seen card this. before. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I kind of think that's fun because I miss of, that. Like, yeah. Part of the joy of magic is, you know, when we were, I mean, both of us played when we were children. Yeah. Right. And we're old now, obviously. So like <laughs> having that experience where you're like, oh, someone plays a card. I've never seen this card before. What does it's this the do? Best feeling. It's actually kind of fun. Like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's honestly a blast. So like, I don't even, if all these supplemental stuff comes out, I'm excited, especially like in Commander, when I see a card that I've never seen before. And I'm like, what is this? It's it that is what keeps me playing commander, honestly, is this joy of discovery. It's this yeah. feeling of like picking up a random card that somebody puts down and you're like, 
I owned the product this card came from. I have never seen this card in my life. Yes. What? Whoa, what just happened? Or seeing like a card just show up in a context you've never seen before, interact with a different card, and it's like, I never thought that that combo was even possible. And it it's it's that sort of thing that just keeps me active and engaged in this game, right? Like, I mean, I think a... that's the reason that this is the greatest game in the world is because yeah. you have the pieces of the game and not only can you use them in whatever manner you want, and I'm talking different formats, different how you how you play with them, but like combining them, and obviously it, it, it can get fairly complex as you add layers and layers of new cards, but like that's what makes really cool moments. And that's what we're here for is exactly. like seeing these two things interact or these three things or these five things interact that you've not seen before. And it's just amazing. And no other game can do that. And that's exactly it. It's just like, because we're in this eternal format, because we've got literally 30,000 cards to choose from, to pull, to make like decks out of. And like, I keep saying over and over again, my favorite part of commander is that feeling of going to an LGS, going to the back in the boxes and finding a random Mercadian masks card. That is the exact right card for your deck. And then just being like, this card is dog crap anywhere else in the world. It did nothing in any format, but in this card with this specific commander, it is going to be with the game winner. And it's like, ah, oh, yes, your time has come. It's the best feeling. And uh, that, that Marketing Mass is a good example because most of the rest of it is crap. So you must be really <laughs> foul. Uh, no, I, but honestly, like to this day, I think personally and like not professionally, like when I've, you know, when I had worked at Star City, Mm. Obviously, I've opened more booster packs. I'm in the top 1% of people that have opened booster packs. Uh, <laughs> not for myself exactly, but um, but personally, I still think to this day, and Mercadian Mask came out when I was... A child? 13 years old, right? And I think I've still opened more Mercadian Mask booster packs than anything else because when I got into Magic <laughs> and I got in in Urza Block... But like when Mass came out, that was the first big set. I got in hard. <laughs> I mean, like I was like, this is the greatest thing. And I probably, honest to God, over that, over like a six month period, like into that summer into the, to Christmas, I probably opened, I don't know, two or three cases worth of Arcadian masks. Oh my God. <laughs> Everything that I did went to magic. And that was the new set. That was the new set that came That's out. That's the worst feeling in the world in hindsight. It's like mask block. Well, okay. Mind it was. You. Well, it, it, at the time it felt great, but man. I yeah. can beat that though, right? Like when I started playing in like <laughs> oh, Dark oh and God, Revised. For your sake. Yeah. <laughs> when I started playing in Dark and Revised in like early Ice Age and I was starting to get into it and get into it, the first set that came out where I had like allowance money and that I was able to save and like middle school and do everything homelands yeah, yeah. And homelands and fallen empires and i was just like buying them by the box and it just yeah oh so many thalids and so many freaking ice and townsfolk and garbage trash and the one playable card deadly insect or whatever hungry mist um we were desperate those times were bad yes. those cards were awful it's amazing i mean it truly is amazing to me it's a testament to how good the game is because right? it should not have lived. How did it we survive? It should not have lived through a two year span where you had homelands, fall empires and ice age and ice and, age. I know was received well at the time, but man, that set's terrible. Dude. I recently went back and I bought an ice age starter deck. I found somewhere and oh, I had bought a ton of ice age when I was a kid. Cause it was beautiful. It was cool. And I was going through and looking at it. I'm like, how how did i do this these cards are all terrible they're, they're all terrible. awful yes. like even the good cards are just like bad versions of revised cards they're like all terrible it's a it's a horrible set and it's also like gigantic it's like 400 cards yeah and there's like and there's like I'm, six good ones right like incinerate and like dark oh, yeah. banishing and that's kind of it like dark I banishing, played a, yeah yeah I, oh that was the first printing of dark banishing so yeah i guess that does count yeah yeah, it was like fair. basically worse terror and worse lightning bolt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, that's that's bad. I mean, yeah, you 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 had to live through the you had to live through a rough time. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's not like revised was particularly better. Like we're talking about no. sedge trolls here, right? Like, no. revised. Yeah, no, I, when I started playing Magic, and for ten years after mm. I started playing Magic, revised was not looked upon fondly. No, and you know. It, 
even now people are like, yeah, man, I want to do draft of beta. I'm like, no, you really, you really don't. don't. You, <laughs> like, don't. you might really... want to do it for the novelty, but you're not, you're, it's not good magic. No, that's like, you're playing scribe sprites and liking it, right? Like this is awful. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's a testament to how evocative the art was, how evocative the flavor was and the feeling of doing something like a casting a fireball at your dragon. That's just like, that kept this game from dying when it really should have. Should have. Yeah, Cause, absolutely. I mean, Mirage was awesome, but like the sets before Mirage, mm, mm, no, not, yeah, not good at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Mirage was, Mirage was great. Visions for a long time was one of my favorite sets. Absolutely love visions. Uh, love it. Enter the battlefield creature. And that was like, Hey, you know what? We can start doing this and actually put meaningful things on <laughs> Necrotal, Manowar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, yeah, we, we got some, got, got some good ones. In there. It's funny though. Cause like I got there and when like Mirage visions came out and I'm like phasing and flanking, man, this game's going to die. We don't need more mechanics. Yeah. What is this crap? <laughs> and, then I just, and then I like basically quit until like Innistrad or Zendikar. And I mean, oh, I wow. read up on, I kept following magic, but I, I'd played other games and moved to L5R Jeez. and Imagination and D&D and whatever. So you get back with Innistrad. Innistrad of all sets, the the largest mechanical shift probably in the history of the game. Well, what got me back was actually playing Duels of the Planeswalkers on the Xbox. Because when oh, that came yeah. out, I was like, oh, I played Magic when I was a kid. And sure, why not? I'll pick this up again. And I was like, oh my God, I love this game. I forgot how much I love this game. Yeah. And then I went and my friend took me to a draft of Rise. Now, mind you, I had never drafted before. I'd read about it, but I'd never actually done it. And I crack open a Sarkin dragon, Sarkin the Mad or Sarkin whatever. Sarkin the Mad. And I'm like, yeah. I've never seen a Planeswalker before. I thought it had <laughs> summoning really sickness. As the first Planeswalker to see. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what the hell do you do? And when you're trying to draft Rise of the Eldrazi, that is an awful set to start with. It is. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, what am I a, doing? That's a beloved set to draft. Oh, now? Yeah. And, and I hated it. I hated it. I love <laughs> Zendikar. I want to go fast. But let me tell you, I never opened Drana, and I died to that card probably like eight times. That card is so good, though. It oh. is. It is when you have it. It's really good <laughs> when you have it. And when you don't have it, you're like, all right, well. Yeah, I mean, I ate a lot of Ulamox crushers, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, like, Innistrad, though, I got it because it's like, it's zombies. It's skeletons. I know what, yeah. I understand the creatures and I can figure out the mechanics. Except my introduction to Innistrad, Worlds. Worlds 2011 was in San Francisco, <laughs> which is where I lived. And I was unemployed at the time. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go and out. check it out. Let's see what's going on. And the draft for five dollars. So I'm like, yeah, I'll play draft. You know who's yeah. drafting Innistrad on Wednesday at Worlds? <laughs> Team Finland, <laughs> right? Sure. Like Team Japan. <laughs> you're sitting there like, oh, Shota Yasaoka just kicked my ass up and down the street. Okay. Yeah, and you're like reading. You're like reading every card, and you're like, these cards. Uh, did these always have two backs? Like, That's when did exactly they do it. this? No. Yeah. And I, I would be sitting there, and I'd be looking at the card, and I'd take the thing I think is cool, and then I'd pass it, and the dude next to me would just hold up like. Did you not take this card for a reason? Like, like, I didn't what are you doing? And I'm like, (laughs) I took the zombie, bro. I don't know what to tell you. It's cool. (laughs) I must have destroyed or derailed so many drafts that weekend. Yeah, you're just like, I'm. I'm just here to have fun. I'm just here for fun. Yeah, I'm just just here after after a what? Like, that's a long break. It well, like 15 years. I I mean, I played enough card games and i'd watched a lot of magic played and i like during um scourge and stuff i had dabbled in it and i'd come back and like my store we would just kind of sit and play with like the starter decks or whatever but i read basically morrow's articles like and daily mtg every day for mm-hmm. like 15 years even though i didn't play it just because yeah. i needed a yeah, daily article in, to read of course and it was in college and i had nothing else to do and but like it was weird because like when i came back to it and then i sit and read duke teaching me how to draft Cause like he beat me and I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. He's like, okay, let me show you how to actually build your deck here. And I'm like, yes, let's go. And then after that, That's now I'm agreed. seriously, a- a- actual factual, nicest person, yeah, one like, of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. It's literally not, the it's year he's, people. Yeah. It's like, he's like MTGO's player of the year or whatever it was. The MTGO champion. Yeah. And he's at worlds and he's sitting there just doing a random side sealed against me. Noob chub who's sitting there like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. He's like, all right, let me teach you how to do this and we can walk you through it. And he took like 20 minutes and showed me how to like build a seal. If he hadn't, I would have gone home. I would have been like, magic was fun. I'm done. I'm moving on to other hobbies and 
rest of my life. Yeah. Instead, I'm like, you know, tears are coming down my face. And I'm like, I won't let you down, Reed. But um, <laughs> that's incredible. It was a good time, man. Like so I met really Marley. have Reed to thank for all of Shivam's ex ex ex. ex, ex I don't know. All, my all empire. Of, all of you in the the magic sphere for the last ten plus years. Well, it's it's because like he set an example that I've followed ever since, which is like, if you are kind to your opponent, if you're kind to the people around you, if you show them how to play, your enthusiasm will make their enthusiasm and their enthusiasm will make your time much happier. And if we're all happy and we're playing, then this is what the social game is for. That's Absolutely. like why I got into Commander. That's why I got into all this stuff is like, I want us to celebrate this joy that we share together. And that's what makes me so happy about magic all the time. Like, that's why the internet like discourse gets so... Like the cure to talking about magic is playing magic, right? Yeah. Like yeah. once you start playing, you're like, oh yeah, this game is awesome and we have fun. It's, oh, man, I, I, there was, I think there was a time where, and I think, I don't know, the rise of Twitter mm. kind of is the inverse of this, but like there was a time where like, maybe when I was younger and I would happily just like hate on stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, what, I wouldn't say that I was a hater, but like, I would I would engage in talking to people on forums or oh yeah flame wars store. all day long yeah just just about or just like this is dumb I, this is why I don't like this now it's just like dog I only care about talking about the stuff that makes me happy right like, any of the things that I talk about that I don't like it's just like irrelevant I've basically grown out of this need to like assert my dominance like there's this whole thing of like <laughs> you don't need to pick teams. You don't like so true. You don't need to be like me being happy about something doesn't take away from your happiness. You being happy about something I'm not into doesn't change my life in any way. I'm just like, you know what? We're good. As long as you're not trying to like harm me, then whatever, man. Enjoy your stack yep. deck. It's fine. Like, who cares? The life is too short. We have too many things to do. And I think, I think that it's just so much more fun to celebrate the things that we like. Absolutely. And if you're like, if you just spend your time enjoying things instead of not enjoying things, it feels so cliche to say, but it's true. If you I like know. things, you're happy. If you don't like things, it's, you're sad. Maybe don't it's so true. Stop it's so hating true. on things all the time. Right. Like, yeah. If like, it's, you know, I'll, when, when people get all worked up about stuff, like sometimes I'll throw a joke in, but then I'm just like, you know what? I, even if I, if I, if I don't like this thing or, or I see other people don't like it. Like, it's just, it's what? not worth the like mental and emotional toll to get invested in that. Mm -hmm. Like I have so much else going on in my life and I love magic. Yeah. And I love to love magic. Right. That's exactly you know? it. So let me just love the things that I love. And it's, and it's more, it's just more fun and it's going to make you a happier person. Exactly. Like you said, to enjoy something and right. put your positivity out in the world. It's just well, it like, took me a long time to realize that. Though. I mean, it's it's a hard lesson to learn, right? Like, because it's so easy to invest your identity into something. And then the second somebody is like, yo, I don't like that thing or I prefer this thing. Suddenly you feel like your personality is being attacked. Yourself is being attacked because you've yeah. invested your identity into being a PlayStation fan or into being a fan of like, I don't know, vampire decks or whatever. Or mm -hmm. like whatever the thing is, when you've invested yourself into that thing and somebody is like, not on board with you then you yeah. feel like you are personally being attacked but once you can divest yourself and be like you know i can enjoy these multiplicity of things for myself without needing your feedback or without needing your approval mm -hmm. like that i think was a key for me was like learning that and this comes back from being a priest is that i learned when i'm dealing with like other religious people and with missionaries and things like that was like when you can divorce your need for approval from other people from your own sense of self-worth you are a much happier person i don't need you to believe the things that i believe i don't need you to like be a vegetarian like me i don't need you to like the kind of jank commander decks i like i can like these things and they can give me fulfillment and if you don't that's cool. i'm not losing myself for your lack of approval yeah yeah. it's 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 tough though yeah it's, it's a tough lesson to learn i mean just in life not even yeah, it's a, about magic but like, yeah exactly it's very yeah. hard to do that because like as people we want to have the approval of the crowd we want to have the approval yes. of other people but learning to just enjoy things for yourself that's where your self-worth comes from that's a self in self-worth right and 
don't know. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people just don't. They, it's. I don't even know how to phrase it, but it's this need that's not. It's not evident to themselves. Mm. So, so a, a, a conversation. I have. I have two kids. I have an almost sixteen year old and eighteen year old. Oh wow! And yeah, they're they're the worst. They're teenagers. But <laughs> my son know, is nine. I know the feeling. Learning. <laughs> well, <laughs> not yet, but I will enjoy <laughs> enjoy it while it lasts. You got about four more years. Um, but you know, just trying to tell my sixteen year old, like, look, you know, we we just moved to a new city a few months ago, started a new school, huge change. They'd only live in one city for their entire lives. So this mm. is a really big life event for them. So making new friends and doing stuff like that. And I'm just like, you know, people, it's okay to like the things that you like, even if it doesn't seem like other people like those things, because the, the chances are, and in my experience, especially, you know, I'm trying to tell him as a, as a dad, and I'm also telling him as someone who has, you know, walked this path of, right. for my whole life of like liking nerdy stuff like magic and like Marvel comics and all board games and all, all, all the stuff that, you know, yeah. now is like the cool. most popular things. Yeah. <laughs> all the things that are cool. But, you know, when I was when I was 15, you know, all this stuff wasn't necessarily cool. So <laughs> but just saying, like, if you put out the things that you like and just and just unabashedly love the things that you love. People will see that, and there, I promise you that there are more people that love the things that you love and will see that reflected yes, in you yes. and be able to say, oh, you know what? That makes me feel more confident about myself. Yes. And then those people will want to be your friend and want to talk with you and engage with you. And it's and that's just in person. And yeah. when you go on an online platform, that, that net gets even wider because you're talking to anyone in the world. So, right. But that, because of that, it's even more important, in my opinion, to do that. That's why, like, so I used to be in the video games industry, and I was a games journalist for a long time. And in 2014, I was one of the forefront of uh, Gamergate, when those guys were just getting very angry about all sorts of, uh, let's say, cultural changes that were happening in video games. And um, <laughs> after that era, what I realized is, like, you know what? the this is not a net positive in my life to engage and fight with everybody and to be angry all the time what if instead i just rededicate myself to being good positive uplifting bringing out the things that make me a better person and helping you become a better person and then if i share the things i love and enjoy with such enthusiasm then you will find the things that you love and enjoy you may not like the things i do but enthusiasm is infectious yes. and when it's infectious and you share with me the things you love I will be happy because I'm like, look, it's a thing you're into. I'm into that because you're into that. Now let's share our things and we can all be happy together. Yeah. And it just, I don't know. It just, it's, it's made my life significantly better to discover that if I just present myself as a happy person who likes things, then people will feed back to me with the happiness and likes. And it's like, this is sweet. Let's go with that. Like, instead of just trashing me all day long for liking the thing that you don't like instead now you're like, hey, I also like this thing. And I'm like, yeah, let's like oh, different yeah. things together. I mean, Yay. I love the love things. Exactly. I love that you love things. You That's love this exactly. thing. I love this thing. We both love things. That's great. It's great. Yeah. It feels good. Uh, yeah, that, I know. The positive feedback cycle is just so, so much more beneficial for everyone. <laughs> right. And just like, <laughs> especially it's like with card games, <laughs> it's so weird because we get very invested. Like recently there was a kerfuffle between like legacy and commander players. And I'm like, Guys, we're literally the same card pool. It's fine. Just enjoy the thing you enjoy. You don't need to, you can be sad yeah. about your card pool without knocking the other person's, like, you know, format. It's just chill. It's fine. Everything is I fine. I kind of watch that. And my, I love Commander, obviously. My favorite 60 card format is Legacy. Yeah. That I've played the most. That I've played competitively for its entire existence so from when it was type, you know, one and a half, one, one point five. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, y'all, you're literally like, first of all, <laughs> I, I don't even, I, I still, I actually don't understand what the, what the upsetness was about. Oh, printing. Yeah. They're angry that the initiative cards. exists. Oh. <laughs> okay. Whatever. What is the Dude, difference? Fine. Whatever. Okay. Don't. Yeah. Okay. Great. Just, you know what? You, so one day, you know, in 20, at the end of 2019, Wizards of the Coast decided they were going to print Oko Thief of Crowns. 
for every format. Okay, we all <laughs> had to deal with that, didn't we? Standard, <laughs> modern, legacy, commander. You know, it's funny. Tiny leaders. What? Take your pick. It was in them all. We so. had a conversation after Oko was banned in every other format, and like Sheldon's like, "So are we banning Oko?" And the entire room laughed. We're like, "No, <laughs> the card is Why? fine in EDH. It's like not even the best simic thing you could be doing. It's like whatever. It it won't make the table. It's it won't even make your deck. It's fine. Chill out. It's everything's fine. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. That's... I mean, it's not like this is the first time that Commanders knocked Legacy on its back. Anyways, like we created True Name Nemesis for God's sakes. And yeah. scavenge ooze and hornet queen, like that's true. I was at uh, GP DC in um, twenty, I guess it was twenty thirteen hmm. when Trinity Nemesis came out, <laughs> and that was the first. It was a leg, the first Legacy GP shortly after that card came out, and we stopped the car that I was with, we stopped at every Walmart and target on the way to see if we could find the mind seas commander deck that true name Nemesis was in, uh, because we were like, these are like really important and we need to have them. Uh, and the card like progressively went from like $20 to 30 to 40 to 50, like over the course of the weekend at the event, it was a very, a very interesting event. I, I specifically remember that when it was the true name nemesis GP Well, and technically in Chantilly, Virginia, but uh, GPDC. Come on, man. They've, yeah. Wati has never landed in the city that they call on the name tag, right? It's always Look, like. As someone who has a significant amount of experience uh, doing events and booking and scheduling and organizing events, it's hard. Yeah. It is hard. It is hard to it is hard to get exactly where you want to be and still call it the name that you want to call it. <laughs> the nearest uh, major metropolitan city. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, look, this this money comes into play quite a bit. And it is not just more expensive for the organizer of the event. It is much more expensive for the players. So every single time you see Bloody Blah DC and it's in Chantilly in the old parking lot that used to be a Walmart. <laughs> Let me tell you, you are benefited from it being in that venue. I can promise you. I can promise you. So I, I never want to hear these complaints. It's so ridiculous to, because people just don't realize like, sure. You know what? You want to have it in downtown DC? Cool. Well, now your trip just got $500 more expensive per yeah. person. So. Can you imagine the hotel cost? I oh can't because we've, I've done that before. No, thank and you. then that's why those events are not in and not in DC proper anymore. Yeah. So what did so you were at Star City for a very long time, almost ten years. Yeah, that's a that's like the entire rise of like magic exploding. Yes, and <laughs> like that's like when magic went from like kind of a niche thing to this huge hobby suddenly out of nowhere, and like the rise of the Star City tour, tour and like mm -hmm. all of the content and all the videos and everything. And you did, you've done Commander Versus for years and years and years yeah. and years and years. I did Commander Versus for eight years. That's a until, long time. last November, yeah. Like, when, God, there's multiple questions I want to ask you here. But first off, when did you find Commander? So I started playing Commander in, so I'll, 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 I'll backdate it just a second. So I started playing Magic in 99. Mm. And I played consistently until 2006. Uh, mm. when Betrayers of Kamigawa came out, I famously, for some people, really dislike original Kamigawa block. I it's... really strongly, strongly dislike it. To the point where I was like, I don't even want to play Magic right now. <laughs> uh, so I had a brief break, and I quit for the remainder of Kamigawa block, and unfortunately also missed all of Ravnica block. And, uh, oh, sorry, I guess, I guess the, not 2004, Six thousand five, two thousand beginning of two thousand five, and then came back in two thousand seven, like when between uh, Plane Shift and Future Sight, so two thousand seven. So my first event back was the Future Sight pre-release. Oh man! <laughs> so which was great because, and that's actually how they got me back in, is because Time Spiral was like, "Hey, guess what? This is all the stuff you love if you played Magic in the nineties." Oh, guess what I did? So this is awesome, <laughs> uh, and it's still to this day Time Spiral is my favorite block. Um, so shortly after that. Uh, in 2007, I first played Elder Dragon Highlander, hmm. and the my very first deck was Momir Vig Simic Visionary. Nice and the classic. goal of the it is a classic, and I got some classic terrible cards to go with it because the goal of the deck was get out Seedborn Muse and Tefri Mage of Zalfir. 
uh, and then just Jeez. play blue and green creatures on everyone's turn to constantly do that. So that was the deck, and that's what I was trying to do. And shortly after that, I was like, this is pretty cool. Now, we were playing with like pods of like five and six and seven feet. <laughs> because this is classic. Yeah, this is early, early days. This is, this is you know, four years before the conceptualization of making this a Wizards produced f- format and mm-hmm. product. Uh, and then I was like, well, you know, I kind of want to make just a bunch of bunch of decks. So then I went out and made, I was like, okay, I'll make one of every like monocolored commander. I didn't end up doing <laughs> when you that. could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'll do a uh, core lash. I had a mono black core lash deck, which I really loved. I was like, cause I want to kill people with commander damage. I still love mm. to do that. I had like a mono white Crovax ascendant hero deck. Mm. Plane chase. Uh, yeah. So early Elish Norn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fair <laughs> Elish Norn. So yeah. So I just, I kind of got in and, it was still isolated because you couldn't, I couldn't go to a, a, a GP or a PTQ and bring my commander deck because people nope. were going to have it. They were not. Nobody knew what commander was. People at the store that I played at were playing, and it wasn't even called commander at this point. It was Elder Dragon Highland. Yeah. People were not playing EDH everywhere. They were at some, the people that knew about it were. So like I played it, you know, probably like once a week at my store. Hmm. And we just played a big four hour like. game that was ultimately <laughs> miserable, but it was fun at the time. It was because fun. This was like a different thing that we yeah. had not, not done. It was novel. Yeah. So, and it's just weird because, you know, so long, um, gosh, it's 15 years ago. That makes me feel really old. Yeah. So f- 15 years ago, first getting into this and I was playing, um, you know, th- this format that, is the same format, but looks quite different than the format it is now. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. So that, yeah, that's, that's, but that's when I got in, that's when I got into commander. Yeah. Like my first EDH deck was with Janara from uh, the Bant uh, angel from, I guess, Alara block. Alara reborn. Where yeah. she's, she's like, you plus can pay one, like plus one counters. Yeah. Plus one, plus one counters, but it yeah, was basically just one. a Bant values and allies deck. Like it was half exalted and half allies. Mm-hmm. weirdly enough it was just kind of like my friend gave me this deck and it's like hey we're gonna play this mode called star and i'm like what does that mean it's like here you take this deck and we sit and play and we do this God. thing and i'm like all right let's talk about a long game yeah right and i was also like i've never played it. and we played it on the forum so it was played by post so it took three months for that first game oh my God. it was awesome but it was also like i don't know what the hell it can dedication <laughs> right there it was just so much fun um but yeah, like when you look back at like these old, I mean, gosh, you must have seen the explosion of Commander then. Like, I did. From when we, like, because I know when I came back to Magic, that's when the first precons came out. And I was like, all right, I'll pick them up or whatever. I'll yeah. get one or two and it'll be fine. And I built my first Commander deck, like a uh, Grim Grin uh, zombie deck. And then, Grim like, great. I found out, like, the year after that, there was a Gate Crash pre release. I opened up Assemble the Legion and I was like, this reminds Ooh, me of my favorite boy. card of all time, Keldor and Outpost. So and so, so I was like, yeah. all right, I'm building a soldier's deck. Let's go. Um, and I still have those two decks. I love them. I can play them forever. Uh, but yeah, man, like, we must have been wild to see this format that you're playing once a week suddenly become, like, big enough yeah. to get pre-cons and then well, big enough the to be thing. the community. <laughs> well, and even when, like, so... When the original Commander product came out, it was not heralded as this like huge thing. No, it was it just was this. It was like, hey, book. we're gonna yeah, we're gonna throw a bone to these people that are playing multiplayer yeah. magic. It was in the plane chase arch enemy slot. It was just like here's the it random a, side. Yeah, here's the random side the random like casual product. Yeah, and it was not even. It wasn't. It wasn't even like a huge deal to the wider magic community. No, it was just obviously a, for the people that played the format. It was like, whoa, we're getting new cards that you could just play in this, and yeah. that was pretty crazy. A command like, tower, what is that? <laughs> yeah, but it was like, well, I mean, not not ignored isn't the exact word, but like it was, it was not a big deal. It wasn't no. as big of a deal. Yeah, because um, like that was in the middle of the height of like Pro Tour Magic was really ramping up, and everybody's like super yeah. in, like modern was just it's, starting. It's actually, and... when modern, ju- yeah, exactly, yeah, modern just started. I was at that. I was at that Pro Tour, PT Philadelphia. Oh man, yeah, PT, um, uh, like was it Shoal, the um, the yes, red Shoal, right? Burning, burning Shoal. Yeah, it's like yeah, mm, I'll kill you with progenitus and burning Shoal. Let's go, yep. GGs. Yeah, uh, yeah, 
that was a hell of a PT too, man. I, yes. I think that was the first PT I ever watched. Like where I was like, oh, oh this is a new world. Um, yeah, what a what a crazy gosh! We tested so many different decks. Tested uh, the the that was known about like <laughs> the primeval a primeval titan the primeval titan cloud post deck mm. was a was a really really God, big cloud deal. post. I miss cloud post. It was so and people were like <laughs> you were trying to tech so hard. People were playing the card treacherous urge. You know what treacherous urge is? Yeah, treacherous urge from plane plane shift uh, or planner planner chaos from planner chaos. And it's like a five, four and a black. And you look at your opponent's hand and you get a creature and you put it on the battlefield and you attack with it. It gains haste, you attack with it and it dies. So you're just trying to get their primeval Titan out of their hand one turn sooner than you can play your own primeval Titan. Anyway, it's, this is a <laughs> irrelevant side of conversation, but point is people were in the weeds. What the hell we is that card? Them. Wow. I've that seems awesome, yeah. actually. That seems like a really cool commander card. <laughs> there you go. Boom. Yeah. Crazy. I'll take that new... blight seal. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> yeah, new cards all the time. I love so, it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, but like it was, yeah, but modern, a huge thing. And then commander's like kind of coming out at the same time. Yeah. God, 2011 was a hell of a year, though, wasn't it? Like that's yeah. like the big flood of new influx. First off, it's like the largest year of like new players coming into Magic or people coming yeah. back to Magic. Duels of the Planeswalkers, yeah. Innistrad, mm -hmm. Commander, Modern starting. Like the PT is at full fledged. Like it's at its peak power. Magic was a different time, and it it got real big real quick after that. It did, yeah. When yeah, did you guys so... start versus? Like right after so, that in 12 or something? So I started at Star City Games in 2013. Doing what? And so, say that. Doing what? So uh, as the, I initially was the assistant general man, not general man, assistant inventory manager. Mm. Um, and then uh, at the beginning of 2015, I got my own department. I was the acquisitions department. So I ultimately, so for the vast majority of my tenure, um, was responsible for all of the cards that we would purchase from players, other, you know, basically that we would, that we would buy, uh, not from a vendor to vendor standpoint, not like sealed product, but like singles that we would buy and then relist on the website. So I was responsible for all of that, as well as all of the grading, like all of the grading guides. I was responsible for teaching everyone how to grade and make sure that my department did that. Man, that is, that is a skill that I do not have. That's Most like people don't. Most Magic people that think that they do don't. <laughs> Fun fact. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So if you've ever ever had an issue from 2013 until what years? 2022. From 2013 <laughs> till 2022, with the grading of cards, you can somewhat blame me. Actually, <laughs> every card that was a hundred dollars or more, and that basically probably for about nine years from like 2014 to 2022, I personally graded. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's a lot touched... of staring at cards, man. Yeah. It's a lot of cards. I've probably touched more black lotuses than everyone that I know combined that doesn't work at, for, for a, a card company or play vintage daily. Well, I mean, I'm talking unique black lotuses. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Fair, yeah. fair. Yeah. I don't think, I have ever no, that's not true. I've I've drafted a black lotus in a cube before, a couple okay. of times. Okay, like playing yeah. vintage cube in paper is one of the coolest things in the world. I'm just gonna is. put that out. Turn a weekend like, going on right now. I actually just uh, loaned uh, one of my closest friends, Stephen Green, uh, one of my black lotuses and a time walk so he can go play Turn a Weekend. That's sweet. Like. I remember once, like, retweet, put out a tweet, like, hey, can I borrow a set of power from anybody for this, like, you know, tournament I'm going to? And I'm like, who's going to lend you power? And some, and I think, like, You'd be surprised. Yeah. And, like, another pro, like, Hall of Fame, uh, uh, Javier, or, like, one of the French guys or something was like, who wouldn't give Reed power? Like, he's going to give it back. You know, it's going to be back. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to have that kind of credibility where yeah. people trust that I'm going to be ethical enough to give them back the thing. Like you that's would a... be you would be surprised in the vintage community how frequently power gets lended to other people. Oh yeah, I mean like because you you know it's coming back. It's fine as long as you have trust and faith in each other. It's mm -hmm. fine. Um, I love cubing. 
I love so, like I've discovered. Let's go back like, to the original question. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I'm like getting off. Of, I know. Thinking about magic because if you bring up Cube, then we can tangent for the next two hours. Yeah, off like of that. But yeah, so, Commander versus. So com- Commander versus. Yes. So <laughs> sorry. The very first Commander versus pod was um, David McDarby. Hmm. Uh, Wizards, who, David McDarby. Now, w- yep, one of my one of my close friends, David McDarby. Yeah, works at Wizards. Works at Wizards now. Worked at worked at Star City. Was a buyer uh, before then. So Commander Versus was his idea. So hmm. he Darby gets all of the credit. It is his idea. His him and John Che, who was the uh, director and producer of the show, and John at this point now is one of my closest friends. Most people have actually seen John's work. He does uh, a he's in the background of a lot of things that are produced in the magic sphere. Um, hmm. I, uh, he, he does a lot for, I, I know he, he works with wizards frequently, so he produces some of their stuff anyway. Um, but it was th- their combination of them. Anyway, first one was McDarby, Chris Van Meter, one of our other directors, Jesse Snyder, who has never made magic content a day in his life. That's his only time he's ever done it. And Stephen Green. Mm. And shortly after that, uh, there was a second pod that was McDarby, Stephen Green, and then Danny West and myself in the second four-player pod. But then Commander Versus, for whatever reason, went to 1v1 for (sighs) like six months. So at first, it was uh, McDarby and Danny West, and they did 1v1, and their... You know, they're they're both. I've played a lot of one v one commander, and I do enjoy it quite a bit. But it's, it's not, not good viewing format. No, no. So, uh, so around the time between the first and second four player pod, that's when they were doing the one v one, and the four player pod was for the point of saying, "Let's try four player and see if this is popular." Because again, this is in this is in like 2013. So yeah, it's isn't not that like, like just like YouTube is still very young at that point? And like, I mean, I guess YouTube's been out for like four or five it's years. It's not young from the standpoint of it existing, but as far as like paper magic being recorded and uploaded on YouTube, yes, that was not like a huge thing that existed. So we and Star City was the, one of the first people that did that in a large degree, obviously, both mm. with their their um, their you know their 5K series into their open series into the SCG tour. Um, so McDarby and Danny are doing one V ones. And then we have this four player game with all four of us. And then shortly after that, like within weeks of us recording these, and we recorded two back to back, both Danny and Dave McDarby leave the company. Mm. Danny actually, he didn't leave the company, but he moved to Philadelphia and he was a remote employee. And then McDarby left and went to go work for wizards. Yeah. So then Steven and I, are sitting here and we're like, well, we thought we were going to be like third and fourth potato on this. And now <laughs> we're back to two players. So then Steven and I start doing two player commander versus for another several months. And we're both like, Hey, you know, this is like fine, but like four player, we need, should have like four players. Mm. So that's, and this is in by this time, this time it happens uh, 2014. So we're early in early in 2014. And that's when we get, uh, our two of our friends who worked for the company at the time, obviously, uh, well, John Suarez, who still mm-hmm. does, he's the assistant, assistant GM for events and, uh, Wes Wise, who no longer works for the company. Uh, but that was, the, those were the four of us. And we are literally just like kind of rolling out there with our commander decks at first. Yeah. Cause you know, that's, that's, how did you, you make do. a new deck for each week or was it just kind of, Oh still- yeah. Uh, well, uh, well at first we didn't need to at first. But, you know, no, we don't have, we, we all had like a few commander decks. We didn't have like a dozen or a thousand, 200, which is how <laughs> many we ended up making. Uh, so, yeah. So we're, you know, we, we're starting with our decks and then kind of, you know, as we're getting in, like, Hey, um, myself and John, who were really the, I, I think it's fair, fair to say we were the, we were the driving force behind the, all of the ideas and implementation mm. of everything. So we come up with like, well, how could we make this like interconnectivity? So we're like, okay, well, what if there is like a point system, like you get Mm. points for things. And then, then we, then I was like, well, let's, what if we did the serialized and we made this like seasonal. Mm. So there was a handful of shows probably for like six months 
maybe not even quite that long, maybe like four, four or five months where we just, we just rolled up and played. There were no seasons. There was no interconnectivity. And then at the end of 2014 is when we started doing all of the seasons and having like themes and all of this stuff. And we would, John and I would basically sit and we would at first, because at first it was just he and I, because everyone else was just like, yeah, whatever you guys tell us, we'll just mm-hmm. do that. So he and I just sit and we're just like, okay, well, let's map out this season. What is this season going to look like? What are all of the themes are going to be? How are we going to connect these things to each other? And then once you kind of get going, you're like, well, this works, this doesn't. And then we'll evolve from there. And then over the course of time, over the next eight years, <laughs> you know, that it, 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 it grows and grows. And then we change cast members. Uh, John leaves for a bit, then Jeremy comes and then Wes leaves and then John comes back. Um, and then that cast is what, that's the most, probably the most famous cast that we've had mm. is, is those uh jeremy john steven and myself um that's the ones i've watched the most of uh, yeah that I mean that's the, the the people that have appeared on the show by far by far the most so uh and then by that time um you know well into that everyone is involved now in our you know was involved in our production meetings where we Basically, at the end of a season, or probably not exactly the end of the season, but nearing the end of the season, we all sit and we map out the next season. And mm. sometimes the next two seasons of what we're going to do. I mean, do if you have enough ideas, go for it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and that's kind of just, and then it just kind of went off from there. Um, I've always we, enjoyed your, like, weird experimental themes. Like, what if we do no band list commander or, like, you know, yeah. no soul ring commander or whatever it is. And it's like, that's interesting to me because I like to see people putting different restrictions on themselves and seeing what, because one of the problems we have with commander, especially that now as we're getting more and more like content and more and more like homogenized kind of vibe with all of our resources and everything is that a lot of people will take the top percentage cards or the, the big name cards and put them into the decks and you kind of get like good stuff or like the best possible decks you can, the most efficient decks you can. And it feels very much like standard or modern where it's like, here, if I'm playing the Meat Hook Masker deck, here's like the seven cards I'm going to have four X of. And it's going to be that formula, right? Whereas when you yeah. force yourself into being like, okay, we can only use cards that have Absolutely. three mono, like three CMC or whatever. Then it's like, okay, now I have to do tricks and try and find weird crap that'll work. Like, oh, will Searing Touch be the card I need? Who knows? Like, you know, it's like, you got to find random. I like to force myself to look at commander from a lens that restricts how big my pool is. It's, it's and I think it's just super fun to do that. To do that. It's so, it definitely is. You get to play. I love magic and all of us had been playing for so long, you know, like uh, of that, of that cast, Jeremy had only been playing since like Zendikar <laughs> or maybe, I, I don't know, some, maybe sometime before that, but he'd been playing the least amount of time, probably, mm. probably still sometime before that, but it was not like this, you know, we all of us had been playing since the the late nineties, the dawn of time, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and we just like I'm I'm fortunate that even prior to my time at Star City, uh, I have a I've used a lot of my brain to remember Magic cards, probably yeah. enough to where I could have done a lot of other things with my life, but instead I chose to remember. A bunch How of magic many of us would be much better off not remembering the Circle Protection artifacts as in antiquities or whatever, right? Yeah, or or me pulling like treacherous urge out of treacherous urge out of the sky, yeah, and, and like and like reading the the CMC and the Oracle text, yeah. So <laughs> y- using using that brain power for good probably would have put me on a different path. But either way, <laughs> this is what we have, and being able to have those restrictions, it's fun because I'm like, oh, I I love so many cards, I love a million cards, right, right, and I'm just gonna play with all these random cards, searing touch, which is uh, is that is that from Ice Age? It's from Tempest. Tempest. Okay. I want one damage and then it cantrips next turn. No, this one is one damage buyback four. Buyback four. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking of Death Spark. Yes. Which you is are. one damage and then. It and it's got that really cool artwork too with the, like the shattering yeah. glass kind of thing. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, that's, I think that one's from. That's from Ice Age. Ice Age. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure I'm wrong. I don't know. EK will put up the right, right card. It'll be fine. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah but we're like, doing great. Because I built my first spell slinger deck ever with Nira because I, I don't play spells. I'm a creatures guy since going way back. And so okay. I'm like, if I play a bunch of one mana instants and then have like, you know, all these minds desire things come off the top, it's great. Let's go. So yeah. like I, me and uh, 
Drew sat in Drew Levin, who was also, you know, a Star Street grinder for a long time. Yep. He sat and helped me find like all these random obscure instants from the history of magic that are just like one mana cantrips or whatever that like. Oh, man. And I'm like, all right, let's go. Just find this random chaff that's like a quarter or less and yeah. just turn them into like consecrated sphinxes. And it's delightful. I'm a I'm a big uh, Whispers of the Muse fan. That That's card, a is good not, card has not been been playable in anything for years, but I always <laughs> want it to be. <laughs> I will just draw. I will just pay six mana to draw a card and put that card back in my hand. God, that card is just like it's so expensive, though. It's, got, it's so expensive. Like I remember Man. when I first saw that, I was like, "That thing says buyback five on it, dude." That's like that's a billion mana for one card. But it I turns know. out when you have just like infinite when mana, you got a billion. <laughs> You could just keep doing it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> and the art was sick too. But um, oh yeah, I love it. I love that card. So gosh, much. man, what is your favorite commander deck? My favorite commander deck is my mono black Yehenny Undying Partisan mm. deck. It is at this point. It's the theme is loose, but it's mostly just black cards. I love black is my favorite color, and fair. Uh, it's I, I would. It started as a Liliana Heretical Healer deck. Mm, that's Flip Liliana, right? Yes, Flip Liliana uh, from Origin. So I, when when she came out, I, that is when I made that when I made that deck, mm. and she's still in the deck. She's she's in the ninety nine. But when Yehenny came out, I was like, this is perfect because one of the and what, what I tell people all the time, one of the most powerful things you can do in Commander is sacrifice something for free without paying any mana. Yes. It. So Yehenny obviously does that, and I love killing people with Commander damage. So it's like absolute perfection so i love I, I absolutely love that deck it's it's got a little bit of sacrifice theme and you know i got i got all the i got grave pact and dictate of erebos and and oh. malik here so yeah i know yeah I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a villain it's fine look i built I've a core vault deck i put my grave packs and all that in there too i understand it's fun i like i like having that level of magic yeah but like i mean my cards my favorite card deck is my mono green titania deck where it's just like i just want to play crucible of worlds and yeah. like scape shift and just ramp into something big and stupid. And it's delightful. It's everything yeah. I want to do. It's like, I just want to play Avenger of Zendikar. Is that so wrong? Yeah. Like no, that card is just reasonable. People just like, Oh, it's such a basic card. I'm like, dude, uh, when you've resolved an Avenger of Zendikar and you don't have a smile on your face, something has gone wrong in your life. Yeah. Like you feel good when you play that card. Cause it's just stupid. It's big and dumb and huge. It's fantastic. And it's, it's, it's literally a, a perfect commander card. It's, yeah. It's such a, such a card represented out of the format. Probably I think that's like one of the top five representative of commander cards. You should do that for one of your Twitter feeds, like top five representative <laughs> commander cards, man. <laughs> yeah. I got, I have some that I'm waiting on. Cause I'm like, I got to make sure that I am. Have thought about this a lot. Mm. That's, that is definitely one. I'm, I'm going to write that one down. Yeah. Cause I mean, think yeah. about it. Let's see. I would put Avenger of Zendikar for green for red. I would pick blasphemous act. Oh, but see, are you doing, are you limiting it by color? I, uh, okay. So I would say, yeah, I would say like, let's pick one per color, right? Cause it's five colors, five for your slot. I mean, if you want to do top five, that's hard. Cause there's a lot but of the, like, yeah, well, like, I know most representative commander cards. You got soul ring. Um, I mean, it also defines your age, right? Like soul ring, maze of it, Avenger of Zendikar. Um, gosh, right, I got, I, a, I got a hot take on mm. that. I think the most perfectly designed card for commander across the board is solemn simulacrum solemn simulacrum is like the, the most perfect perfectly commander designed card. commander card it, it was in every commander deck from like 2011 until like 2016 or not, like 2008 till 2016 or something it was just the yep. iconic card. i think okay sakura tribe elder is perfect commander card yeah uh solemn simulacrum perfect commander card avengers Zendikar, absolutely let's see uh I don't know. Blasphemous Act comes up there, or like um, Blasphemous Act's a good one. Yeah, that's like a real. Or that's what's the one, one that does like everything does damage to itself equal to its power or something? Uh, or e count the number of creatures on the table. Chain reaction. Yeah, that's a that's a beater. But yeah, like, I think yeah. Blasphemous, Blasphemous Act, Act is, just is like definitely clean. that's like yeah, because that's like the red sweeper. Right? Yeah, damnation. That comes damnation, up. Damnation. Damnation. I think I feel like Blasphemous Act's more iconic to Commander than Damnation. I think so too because it's just big. It's big yeah. and dumb and just like, ah, it feels good when you resolve a Blasphemous Act. Yeah, it's fun to like count the creatures and be like, okay, there's eight creatures, <laughs> one mana. Yeah, let's go. Or yeah. like, 
bribery or treachery those were good oh, cards. oh those that, that, see and those are i feel like people don't play as much anymore yeah i miss uh, that i love those cards they're so much fun yeah Spelljack. Yeah, do you remember Spelljack? Oh, spell, uh, absolutely that uh, card ju- is judgment like, staple it's yeah. so good uh now i feel old i'm just thinking about like remember when we had cool cards that did dumb things and cost 30 mana <laughs> Yeah, spell, spell jack, fantastic. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a tough. I, I wrote I wrote that one down. I might have to marinate on that. Yeah, maybe that's I'll like... do it. Maybe I'll do it for each color, and mm. then maybe one for for all of. I don't know. It's tough. That's tough. Yeah, it's... those get those get divisive. Yeah, those get divisive for people. I'm not. I, I try to avoid ones that are going to make me the main character of Twitter for. The day. <laughs> um, I got one that I've been sitting on that pro- probably will never see the light of day because it will make it will be main character. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, dude. I've had times where I just put up a card with no context, no words, and people just start fighting. Like, just randomly, just get so mad about whatever it is, and I'm like, yeah, it's just I hit random and I hit paste. You guys figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I love that though. It's like, I think I I'm enjoy most... it. I, I freak. I, I, I love that's like, that's one of the things on Twitter that I look forward to the most <laughs> because it's unbiased. You're just like, I'm going to just hit this and then I'm going to show you what it was. Yeah. There's no context. I'm not telling you my opinion. Nope. I'm just saying, this is the card that came up. Here you go. It's like, literally for me, it's, it's seven in the morning. I just woke up or like yep. six in the morning. I haven't woken my son up yet and I'm about to take a shower. Random copy paste whatever it is happy birthday good luck (laughs) and then you're just like sometimes it's a card that's just like an intro deck card you've never seen before sometimes it's like commander staple and like iconic or like you know one day it was like kibler who's like yeah you know i won worlds with that card or something and i'm like oh well that's cool (laughs) good for you i guess yeah oh man i love i love magic i just love looking at cards i love playing (laughs) the game with you it's so much i mean it's so easy these days, especially for people to get so mad about this game and for like valid reasons, for invalid reasons, for any number of reasons. But at the same time, it's just like my desk is covered in magic cards. All my friends play magic. All of my, you know, my social skills and all of my hobbies and stuff revolve around this game. Every time I play it, I feel good. Every time I go to an event, it's revitalizing. It's like, ah, this. I love this game. It's great. It's, it's fantastic. Great. I've literally, and honest to God, all of my closest personal relationships I've met through this game. Isn't my best great? friend I've I've met through playing Magic. All of my other very close friends met through playing Magic. My partner met while working for Star City Games when we both were there. Dang. So, it, I mean, literally every person in my life that I keep in contact with is because I play this game. And I'm, that's not even an exaggeration. That's not my, that's not like my yeah. blood relatives. It's just, it's, it brings us together. And that's why it's like the, the community is so important to me. And like, especially through pandemic, when we were all stuck at home and had no way of getting out, having spell table, having discord, having the ability to just reach out and talk about cards with your buddies. is just, it kept me going through this pandemic time. And like, when I went back to Vegas for that first event back, it was like this just sense of, relief and overwhelming happiness at seeing all these people knowing that we lived that we came through and that we're all back and have this communal experience again it's just it's it's revitalizing like when i was at richmond this year the beginning of summer for a uh, command fest and it's just like oh my god we're here it's back we're doing this let's go it was so good ah it's hard to feel bad about the game when you get to to sit and play and see your friends again yeah it's still just fantastic it's that's that's it's, it's truly the best game in the world. And yeah. So then, why did you? So what are you doing these days? Well, so I left Star City after working there for ten years. A long time to work anywhere. It's a long time to work anywhere. It's a it's a meaningful chunk of my life, like a quarter quarter of my life being at one place. That's which is a long time. Yeah. And I decided that I kind of wanted to do my own thing, and uh, currently. I have a, I have a number of plates spinning in the air, not all of which are necessarily obvious on a day to day basis for mm. people that are kind of watching on the outside. But I'm starting to do content full time ish, uh, getting trying to get my my YouTube channel for Magic off the ground. Mm. I'm working on a, another YouTube channel that is not Magic related, 
Um, that's that's T- TBA at this point. Hmm. Um, I have a couple of other projects that I'm that I'm working on. Some hmm. collaboratively that have to do with magic. Some not. So I really just I was to the point from financial perspective of like I've worked for 20 years, saved a lot of money. I am in a position to be able to kind of just do what I want and make myself happy and work for myself and get out what I put in. So That's I was pretty like, awesome. you know what? I think I'm going to do it. And uh, in the last 13 months, I kind of had w- w- the most difficult year of my entire life was the end of 2021 and most of, most of this year. My mm. my I'm an only child and my parents are really old. They're in like 70. And my dad had a stroke last November, which mm. caused me to actually kind of abruptly stop all of the content that I was doing. I was doing two podcasts, I think twice, which was magic and pop culture podcast. And then I was doing the 540, which is a cube podcast. I was doing commander verses and uh, I ended up, my parents live in South Carolina and I ended up kind of abruptly moving there for three months mm. away from my family, my partner and my, our kids um, to be with my dad. Cause I didn't, you know, didn't know if he was going to live. He's sure. not, it was a bad stroke. He's still very, very, very slowly recovering from it. And that kind of put a lot of things in perspective for me, mm. not just from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint and from a, who, who I am and who do I want to be and what do I want to do with my life? Mm. And it really gave me a lot to think about. And when I came back in January, back home to Roanoke at the time to be with my family, to go back to work, you know, I just thought, just thought a bunch. And I was like, what am I, am I happy? Like I actually want to take evaluation of this Mm -hmm. because I was for three months, I was not happy when I was gone and it was difficult. And I, well, you upended your life, man. There's, I did. It's hard to find happiness when you're trying to struggle with this separation from your own family and caring for elderly. It's like that is a very yeah. stressful position to be in. It's the most stressed. I mean, I I've, I've never had a panic attack before, but I learned what I learned what that what well, happened. It's not a good time. Do. No, it's not. And uh, but it it I I grew from from that uh, at least a little bit and really just kind of said, you know what? I, I need to think about what is important to me as a person. Mm. And if that means making a large change in my life for myself and for my family, making sure that we're all happy, that I'm setting all of us up for success in the future. Maybe that means moving to a larger city to give my kids more opportunities or uh, working for myself or in a capacity where I'm doing something that benefits me long-term, not just from like, not from like a financial standpoint necessarily, but from a happiness standpoint, yep, from a mental health standpoint. And I just said, you know what, I, this is what I want to do. And through a significant amount of therapy, uh, <laughs> I made the decision to do that. So yeah. So now I'm, I'm making, doing some content, I have time now for, you know, after, after making content and I made content, magic content for a long time. Yeah. Uh, for as long as it'd been magic content for 10. Yeah. For 10 years, I started in, um, I started in 2010 making, making magic content. I mean, before I did commander versus I wrote cube articles for star city yeah. for years. And actually that's actually when I stopped doing cube articles is when I started doing commander versus cause I switched over and, uh, so not doing it for a year, not doing content for a year, that was like kind of, that was like kind of foreign to me, mm. but I wanted to make sure that I had time for my family because I was still, and I still do going to visit my parents like every four weeks. And mm-hmm. I also had not seen friends or family for three months. And I'm just like, you know what? Something's got to give the content portion, which I was spending 20 to 30 hours a week on. Uh, has to be the thing that's got to give. So that was the decision, mm-hmm. but I still wanted to do it because I love magic. Like we've talked about, yeah. I love magic. <laughs> I love talking about magic. I love making magic content. I love talking to other people that enjoy my content and that make their own. I just love, I love this entire thing. So I wanted 
to do something that made me happy. And that is a big factor of it. Yeah. So it's, it's really important though, to break out of this kind of like rut or this track that you're in and take a moment to breathe and be like, okay, where am I? Is this making me happy? How can I make this make me happier? Or how can I break out of this kind of this pathway that I'm walking down? It, like you need to pause and reevaluate your life. Like every now and then you got to look down at the board state and be like, well, wait, where are we? What do I have? What can I do? Is what I was about to do last turn still relevant now? Right? Like it's especially like for me with lockdown, um, it's the same thing happened. Like I was working at one place for 10 years almost I was a week shy of getting my 10th anniversary but then Comcast bought our company and fired us all and it was and after that I was just like well they gave me severance and I have a lot of severance and even though I live here in the bay area the most expensive place in the country to live my yeah, wife yeah. had a job but my kid was like you know struggling in school cuz like he's 6 7 at the time and he's going to kindergarten via Zoom which is hard and he's got ADHD you can't do that somebody's got to sit with yeah. him and I was like you know what instead of trying to work instead of trying to do any of this stuff I'm going to just take this money that they gave me, chill on it, and raise my child, help him not die in this isolation box that we're in. The, and This hellscape of the world. Yeah, right? Like, it's it was hard for us, and we're adults. It's yeah. impossible for children who have no idea what's going on and why they can't go play with anybody anymore. And, like, I was like, I can't do this. I need to raise my kid. And now, finally, I'm like, you know what? he's back in school. We're kind of level. I can start looking for jobs or whatever again, but like, yeah, I stopped. I took time and I was like, how do I want to interact with magic? How do I want to interact with D and D or with the world? And I'm like, I started my podcast and then a week later lockdown happened. Right. So it's like, well, I Perfect guess timing. doing an interview podcast is the best thing to do now. Cause it's the only thing I can do. Um, and it was just like being able to reevaluate where I was, who I was, what I wanted to do, like with, my spiritual training with my work, with my family life. Like my wife and I just celebrated our 14th year last week. Um, and so it's like, okay, how can I make this magic thing into something that will not bankrupt me and also give me fulfillment? And I found that with, you know, making podcasts and with doing this content and, you know, upping my Twitter game and whatever, and just like spreading positivity in our community. It makes me happy joining the CAG and being able to support my favorite possible way of playing my favorite game makes me happy. And I would not have been able to do that if not for like, and I mean, this year sucked. Like my father-in-law passed away suddenly after like, right after Easter, just, you know, we went spring break. We went to like vacation. He comes back and like, gosh, I've got this weird cough that's not going away. And then next week it's like, mm. well, I'm dead. And it's like, Oh, <laughs> Oh. And so, you know, like, my wife lost her grandparents and her father in like one calendar year. And that's like super rough. So I'm here to support her and here to handle that. And my family all lives here. So we're all very close, but it's been hellscape for all of us. Right. And so being, being able to have this outlet where I can still explore my happiness and find grounding so that I can still support my family has been really, really important. And wow, this episode got really introspective in it, unexpectedly it but i yeah. love that i love that like i love that you never know where it's gonna turn yeah. right like sometimes it's just like hey let's talk about our favorite cards and sometimes like what is the meaning of your life justin I, <laughs> like what are we here to do it's weird. <laughs> a question i've been thinking about a lot so well and, you know man thank you so much for joining me tonight it's been a lovely conversation well we, i appreciate for you having me on and thank you for sharing there at the end i i i'm I feel like we're all fortunate that you, that things kind of lined up in your life so we can, we can experience you on a daily basis and have you have this podcast and be a part of the magic community. That is because, incredibly kind of you to say, and well, maybe undeservedly, but I appreciate no, it anyways. Not. You're, <laughs> you're, you're being, you're being awfully, awfully <laughs> humble, but uh, we, you are very appreciated. Well, thank you so much, man. Um, you should come on again sometime because I feel like we have barely scratched the surface and have lots we could talk about. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I like we were like, Hey, we could talk about all these things. And then we, didn't talk about anything Hoped on like one of them <laughs> yeah it's uh, but that's my favorite part of conversation right it's this is not a a scripted show i don't have a list of questions i'm just like what do you want to talk about where are we here and now what are we into talking about and just go with it and that's what makes it fun for me so 
If people wanted to find you though and find your stuff, find your show, where could they go? What could they see? So they my for social media, I'm most active on Twitter. You can follow me at jparnell1 on Twitter. I am fairly active. Uh, I post, as we mentioned, top five lists every morning. Sometimes they're magic. Sometimes they're not. I always a lot. have people argue about them. Um, probably, probably you. And I don't mean Shivam. I mean, whoever is listening right yeah. now, <laughs> the Royal you, uh, my YouTube channel, which is, uh, focus on magic. I'm focusing on singleton formats, mm. which could be, you know, for magic arena formats, we have, Oh, we didn't even get to talk about gladiator, man. Gladiator. Gladiator. Oh, I love gladiator I know, so much. Uh, that's the it's the it's the best format on Magic Arena. Uh, so historic brawl, gladiator, uh, cube, commander, maybe some Canadian Highlander. So because I love my that, language, man. <laughs> my favorite way to play Magic is just singleton Magic, the all the way to the casual end, all the way to the competitive end, and I I absolutely love it. So that is what that YouTube channel is, and it's youtubecom slash at MTG. Nice should be should be quite easy with the new way that they did handles. yeah so. like oh god i have to pick a handle for this channel i'm like dreading that but i will deal with that later oh they already assigned it they just <laughs> assigned it like this week so you got to go change it. it probably says like your name and then added like 40 letters oh jesus okay i'll go ahead and take a look anyways thank you and uh as always my friends you can find me at Giropuri gears you can find this podcast anywhere podcasts are sold or at cool stuff on tuesdays or at youtube on thursdays thank you to my editor ek and remember my friends it is not magic without the gathering and we will see you next time